I first heard Brian speak um, in Washington DC uh, last year, in April last year, at a CIB uh, IDDS uh, workshop. Uh, I was spellbound. And um, the, uh, the great thing about uh, sitting near the front of a room and uh, hearing someone like Brian speak is that I was able to get to him first um, as he spoke and uh, stepped down. And so immediately I said, Brian, we need to get you to the World Building Congress in Brisbane in May in 2013. And he thought, who is this guy? Uh, and what is this place called Brisbane? And what's this World Building Congress business? But you know what, he's here, and I'm just delighted that he's here. Um, and the, uh, the place called Brisbane is in a country called Australia that he's never even visited before. Um, so I'm delighted to start this uh, collaboration. We talked yesterday about uh, Martin Fisher and uh, us not being able to keep him away from the place after his first visit in 1996. And 17 years time, Brian, we want to be um, continuing the relationship here uh, with the CIB, with QUT and the SBE. And at this stage, um, you know, it's going to be a great uh, 28 and a half minutes now. A little bit about Brian. Um, he's the manager for integrated building solutions for Turner Construction Company in the US. Now, Turner turnover $9 billion worth of construction work a year. It's... Um, it's a fairly serious um, delivery, and I'm thinking about uh, New Zealand's industry that I heard yesterday from Peter Berghout. It was 10 billion a year. So Turner, are your man, you know, this is your man to turn over the New Zealand construction industry in one company. Um, it's the largest general builder in the US. He supports Turner's building information modeling implementation in pre-construction, construction and facilities management. He also develops and delivers BIM training programs to enhance the skills of Turner staff, including Turner's BIM University, an immersive eight-week advanced BIM training program for employees. Brian joined Turner in 2001 as a field engineer and has worked his way through the various field cost engineering and management positions on projects across the country. Um, he holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Virginia Tech and was a member of the first graduating class of the VDC Virtual Design and Construction Certificate at Curtin, sorry, at Curtin, gee, at uh, Stanford University um, in SIFI, uh, one of the first certificate programs of its kind in the world. He's presented on BIM at the Turner Innovation Series uh, conferences in Istanbul uh, and in Moscow um, and uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil and at the CIBW 78 uh, in Cairo in 2010 and at events throughout the United States. Uh, Brian Krauss, everybody, if you could make him very welcome. All right, I'd like to first just start off by thanking uh, Keith and John for uh, inviting me to come talk with you guys today. Uh, to put things into context, to go just a little bit further, uh, Turner was founded in 1902. Um, like Keith said, $9 billion in annual volume. Uh, we've got 42 offices across the United States, and, but we've done work in 60 countries across the world. Uh, 5,000 employees, and um, like Keith said, normally considered uh, the number one general builder on engineering news and um, ENR magazine. Now, the way that Turner frames all of this, um, BIM, Lean, Integrated Project Delivery, we, we call it Turner Integrated Building Solutions. Uh, and we have a mission statement in support of our core business. Every phase of construction will be analyzed for process improvement through the use of new technologies, innovative thinking, and solutions integration. And uh, we really group Lean, BIM, and IPD as part of that integrated building solutions with cloud, social, and mobile, and green building, closely related, but still within other groups at, at Turner. Now, the way that kind of comes together is we've been hearing a lot about how wasteful the construction industry is. That's the problem. The process is lean construction and how we implement those process improvements on our projects. The structure is a collaborative delivery, whether it's formal or informal, through an integrated project delivery or or just a, a, a teamwork-based design build. And then we've got all kinds of tools that we're using to help on top of these problems, processes, and structures. So the way I frame my talk here for the next 20 minutes or so is um, around how we plan, how we build, how we operate, and then how we educate our staff to do all this um, on, on construction sites. So to start, how we plan. 
every good project using these tools has a good BIM project execution plan. And um, whether we're using one from the US Army Corps of Engineers or Penn State or VA or one that we've created internally, it's creating a very detailed BIM project execution plan. But now we're starting to add in lean concepts into that, that execution plan. And sometimes lean can get a little bit heavy in process discussions. And you really, it's, it's hard to tie down what do we really do? What can we do on our projects? So we, we created a top 10 list. So these are the top 10 things we can do on our project to help with process improvement on those, on those projects. So we'll try and define these lean items uh, that we can do to help improve process performance as well as defining how we're going to use BIM in conjunction with them. Now a lot of what I'm going to be showing, um, they don't really fall into a category of BIM or lean or IPD. It's, it's, I hope you see that some of the lines are starting to blur because we are putting them together. So the number one thing on that list is developing people. And I can't stress enough that teaching our staff, teaching our project teams how to work together, uh, even if we don't have a true contractual arrangement that allows us to work in that, is, is very important. Because that'll help us have that successful project that'll be, allow us to do some of those collaborative things and, and break down some of those traditional barriers. So we really do a lot with working with our people. Now, um, for anyone that was in the, the, the previous IDDS session, you saw a great case study on Sutter Health. Now, that fell into the, what we would call the, the tri-party, true IPD uh, type project, which is down at number three. But we do 1,500 projects a year at Turner, and I'd say we've probably only done five, maybe 10 IPDs um, in our history. So re realistically, we're getting a lot more of the number ones and number twos more joint, joint agreements that may have some shared savings that are design build, design assist type, type arrangement, and, um, and that's what we have to work within. Uh, you know, we're a $9 billion a year contractor, and, um, and sometimes we can't wait for the co contractual arrangement to catch up. So we're using these things regardless of that, that uh, contractual arrangement. Now, the way we develop people, um, we'll start adding in some of those technology tools. So this is an example uh, down at Miami Children's Hospital. We did a highly um, rendered visualization of the, of the hotel room. Uh, we have one of these 3D headsets out of our Boston office, and our staff flew down, and they, they sat with the, the nursing staff, with the design team, and we put them in the immersive VR um, environment. It, it was actually kind of interesting what, what happened on, on the job, because some of the designers um, there were certain things that showed up that they weren't expecting to show up, and it was very clear to the client um, what was happening, and, and uh, it, it made the design almost too clear, I think, for the designers um, of, and where they were in the, in the design process. Another example of this is at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and this one's kind of interesting. This is um, one of the surgeons there, and what he's got in his hand is the wand, and what he's doing is he's actually grabbing a piece of equipment that we had floor mounted in the model, and he's picking up that piece of, of equipment and snapping it in the ceiling because he preferred that piece of equipment to be ceiling mounted with miscellaneous me metals versus being floor mounted. So these are the type of live interactive things that we're doing with our design teams, with our ownership teams, where they're moving the model around, making design decisions where it's a lot cheaper in the virtual world. Now, from this, uh, we start doing what we call target value design. And that target value design, we, we break our teams into different components. And those different components then use the model, use the intelligence in the model and the data in the model to, to look at different design options. And obviously, this being a, an information model, these quantities and costs are automatically generated, both visually and in the data and in the cost database, uh, so that those individual target value design teams are are seeing very quickly the different design options that are changing. And then we take a look at the, all of those overall budgets, whether it's mechanical, whether it's structural, whether it's the exterior wall, and we see the trends as those design exercises with the models start happening. And you know, it's okay if one goes up, if another one goes down, to stay within that target value design budget. Then we may put together an A3, which is kind of a one-page summary of something that we, we determined from doing those target value design exercises. This is an example showing an HVAC system life cycle cost analysis where we looked at the initial cost, we did some studies, and we were able to, in a one-page document, 
uh, show the team um, might be some more initial costs, but over the life cycle of the building, it's um, more intelligent to use a different type of system. Now that starts leading into another topic, which we call total cost of ownership. A lot of times when people hire Turner, they just think of this red piece of the puzzle, the, the construction costs. And granted, that's probably the largest piece of the, the construction project cost, but really, if we can start influencing some of the other pieces of the puzzle, um, it may affect some of the costs in construction, but it may be better for the overall um, cost of the project. Some of those things that we're doing are, are life cycle studies or energy analysis or daylight simulations within the model. I'd say from a contractor perspective, this we haven't done a ton of um, unless we're very closely teamed with our design partner, um, but we are seeing some of this as part of our total, total cost of ownership model. Now, something else that we've started doing at Turner is um, we've created some plugins for um, commercially available software. This is a plugin for SketchUp, and uh, we, we found that our staff really liked using SketchUp, especially in the, in the conceptual estimating stage. So we created a plugin, which we call Quantify, and um, it adds some properties to SketchUp that allows you to pretty much do the same clicks that you would on something like an on-screen takeoff type software, but then it adds the um, information to that, to that SketchUp program. Uh, we, we developed another uh, plugin for Revit, uh, as well as Navisworks that pulls out attribu attributes out of the model, um, and then we can use those attributes in an Excel spreadsheet and put them in Timberline or, or another costing database that we might use. So, um, you know, we, we're trying to put all of these plugins that we may be creating um, under a, an, an umbrella, which we're calling Voxel, um, really just so we can help identify what they are. Uh, at, at Turner, we're not a software developer by any means. We're just working with existing software that's there, like Revit, like SketchUp, but then we're using folks, and, you know, there was a question earlier about how does the educational world start translating into the industry. We're using folks from your universities to help us develop these. So it's your universities that we hire as a, as a full-time engineer, and um, they're helping develop these. Um, you know, it's not our 40-year veteran construction builders that are developing these things. It's, it's your folks. So, um, you know, it's something that we're just doing to help improve our process. Uh, something else we're doing is uh, we, we've just recently started doing some safety planning in the model. Um, in, in the United States, we have something called uh, Jiffy Lube, which is where you take your car to get your oil changed. And um, whenever you get your oil changed, they do like a 35-point safety checklist of your car. So we've developed the Turner 50-point BIM safety checklist where we've written some rule sets, both within Revit as well as in Salibri, and um, they're based on OSHA or based on our job site safety requirements um, that we need to have, and we'll put our model into that safety checker um, and really do that 50-point safety check before we go out onto the site and before we start implementing. So we'll know if there's a penetration in the slab. If it's a small penetration, we may not have to do anything. If it's a larger penetration, we may have to put, you know, a plywood cover over it. If it's a very big penetration, we may have to put handrails around it. So by putting the model in this environment, we're able to check those things quickly before we, we start the project. Another nice thing that we've done out of our New York office is um, we submitted our first 3D uh, safety permit submission to the Department of Buildings. So this was the first time in the New York City Department of Buildings that we actually submitted a 3D model and they accepted that. And we submitted it as well as we, we loaded on iPads for them. So when they walked out into the site, they could look at our, our safety in real life on the iPad. And um, I think it really started something there at the Department of Buildings because now they're starting to open up their, their eyes to accepting 3D design submissions as well as just site safety submissions. The final thing as part of the plan stage that I'd like to talk about is um, planning versus managing. And as part of that planning phase, we do um, pool planning. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen these sessions in action, um, but using the sticky notes um, with all of our subcontractors and all, all of the parties in the room and really taking a look at how we're going to put that schedule together. And what we're trying to do is start introducing the model to that environment as well. So we're not only just looking at individual activities on a sticky note, but we're actually looking at that live in a model with some preset simulations that we've done. Um, and what you're seeing here on the bottom right is, is some of the equipment being moved into a, into a tight mechanical space and what would have to be done there. Now moving on to the build phase, um, there's the planning phase as part of collaborative pool planning, but then there's also the, the managing phase and tracking of your productivity 
um, and tracking it versus that plan. So we'll start looking at our percent plan complete and we'll start looking at how much work in place did we actually commit versus our plan. On the left hand side is more of a traditional way um, you know, for as many years as we've had highlighters, you know, we walk into the trailer after a slab pour and we'll highlight what got poured that day and we'll put the date on it. Well, that's static information hanging on the wall, whereas now we can highlight that information in the model and it's got the cost and schedule information tied back to our plan and we can see how we're, how we're doing as it relates to our plan. Another thing that we use is a constraint log and, and really it's, I'd say it's a glorified um, action item list from, from meeting minutes. Uh, but really, when you start showing how many items did you get done since the last commitment meeting, um, and you really show that um, you got 50% done, you got 48% done, we got 75% done, um, it really starts putting the point on who needs to act a little bit more timely in their decisions to keep the process moving. Uh, something else as part of that, that voxel um, piece, we're, we're working with a developer and we've created kind of an electronic version of the sticky note process. Um, you know, this is showing one of our engineers using it on a smart board, but it creates that data electronically so you don't have to capture that afterwards from those sticky notes. Um, I, I'd say one thing though with this, I'd say it still doesn't replace the interaction that happens when someone walks up with sticky notes and you have uh, everyone kind of in the room doing it by hand and jotting down their, their, um, their activities and, and committing to them by writing it out on paper. So that's one thing I'd say we've found by using the electronic tool. Uh, we've got lots of um, iRooms set up across to create those collaborative environments, and we've also got them virtually. Uh, so we're using a, a couple different software where we'll use teleconferencing and webinar um, type activities um, where you can either watch it from your iPad or from the smart boards, and everyone can collaboratively mark up the, the space that we're collaborating in. Now, moving on to the build side of BIM, this is a... Uh, laser scan of Madison Square Garden. For anyone familiar with Madison Square Garden, it's in New York City, it's where the, the New York Rangers play and the New York Knicks play. It's one of, I'd say, the, uh, the, the most well-known um, arenas in the United States. And we did, we were doing some renovation of current seating as well as suites. And we did a complete laser scan of the entire facility, turned that laser scan into a usable model, and then used this model as part of our coordination process. So started looking at those existing conditions and tying that in with the new stuff that we were constructing. So our trade coordination, it's gotten, I'd say, a lot more detailed and a lot more complex since the early days when we started it, I'd say, six or seven years ago. Um, we've got a lot more um, access space and more of the soft space that we're modeling, as well as we're doing more with underground coordination as well as above ceiling coordination. Uh, one case study that I wanted to pull up is our Denver VA Medical Center. And one thing I'd like to highlight here, you know, the question came up in an earlier session, um, you know, who built the model and who built the Revit model, who started the Revit model. Uh, this building actually had 120 and, and counting uh, Revit models on this project. So a lot of our trades, instead of working in 3D CAD, they were actually working in Revit. And we've got an entire process there of just how to manage that much data and that much information on that project with that many Revit models um, coming from all the different, all the different uh, 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 participants in the project. A lot of this starts leading then to prefabrication. We're seeing a lot more prefabrication on our projects, uh, moving directly from that model into um, prefabricated parts in different on-site and off-site warehouses, um, whether it's bathroom pods, MEP racks, head walls or piping. We're seeing a lot of different things that are coming onto our projects now that, that we're helping um, initiate both in the buyout phase and grouping subcontractors together as well as um, you know, um, helping make it work with, with some of the BIM that we're doing. Um, just a couple of case studies where, where we're doing this. Now something we're trying to do with, with prefabrication is not just prefab a bathroom pod and say, all right, we're done with prefabrication on this job. We're starting to try and connect the prefabricated modules together, both in the model environment as well as on site. So we may have a prefabricated bathroom pod and then an MEP rack and then a patient headroom, uh, patient room head wall for that hospital and then we're trying to connect those to create a, a larger prefabricated mo module um, to be put together and connected on site. As part of this entire process, we really try to have continuous improvement, um, another lean concept you know, using the PDCA, plan, do, check, adjust 
model. So we're really trying to look at what we're doing, measure what we do, and then adjust to make sure that we're doing it better next time. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing that, this is um, a quick metric that we did for our clash detection process. The, um, the one column there, the third column, shows the total number of clashes that we had when we ran it in Navisworks, whereas the fourth column shows the total number of actual documented clashes. So how many things were actual legitimate clashes and not duplicates and not um, things that really like flex duct that we could just move around in the field. And if you look at that, only 28% of our clashes that were generated by the software were actually real. And when you think of that in a lean concept, that's 72% waste that's part of our process. So as we're running clash detection, there's 72% waste in that. And we're trying to change that. And actually, this was done back in 2008. The software's gotten a little bit better to group some of those clashes. And we've done some internal things to help eliminate some of that waste. Another nice metric that's come out of this is um, we, we uh, track our productivity based on thousands of dollars per man month. So on a traditional job, um, mechanical, electrical, fire protection, they may put in place around $15,000 a man month. So one worker will put in about $15,000 a man month. And I did a study of um, four VIM jobs and four non-VIM jobs in the DC area. And when I looked at the four VIM jobs, the productivity for mechanical was actually around $37,000 a man month. Um, electrical was around 20, 25, and fire protection was around 20. So we, we saw a big increase in our productivity on those BIM jobs. Again, I tried to focus on where the biggest bang for the buck was with us doing mainly clash detection and coordination on those projects. We're starting to see more dashboards on our projects um, so that anyone at any time can log in and see these metrics and act on them as part of their process. Um, and we're also using more RFID and barcoding to feed some of that data. On the left is um, what we're using as, as an entry portal to our jobs um, with, with um, passive RFIDs on the hard hats so that we can know who's on the job. And um, on the right-hand side is more using the, the barcodes for material tracking, which we've tied back to our submittal logs. So as you scan that, you can see if that submittal's been submitted and, and approved or not. Um, we're also starting to take the model out into the field. Um, um, and, uh, oh, there must be some sound with this one. Uh, but uh, um, uh, we've actually created an, an app, which isn't quite available in the iTunes store yet, but it, it uses the scanning of a barcode with augmented reality. So that you, And there's some similar apps already out there, but we're using it where you can overlay that augmented reality, but pull from that barcode database that has the active model already in it. So um, next I'd like to talk about how we operate and how we use these models and these processes to operate the facility. Um, again, like I said, we're not a software developer, so we're working with other software that's out there, but we're then putting things on top of it. And um, this next one we call Voxel Library and Voxel Monitor, and they're, they're built on the Veo platform, um, but we've linked them in with the client's building management system. So what you're seeing here is um, this is our Columbia University project. On the left-hand side is the active BIM that we use as part of the process for coordination and, and cost estimation and schedule simulation on the job. And on the right-hand side are, is the, the live temperature sensor data that we link to the building management system. Um, on this job, there's around 600 physical center, uh, sensors that we, we linked it with. Uh, the, the way Columbia wanted to do it was uh, they only wanted a one-way view. They only wanted to be able to view this, the temperature data. They didn't want to be able to change the sensor data from the BIM model. Um, so you could click on different room objects, which we linked with those sensor data um, information. And then you can see the temperature as well as alarming information. Uh, we also linked um, you know, 3,500 documents to this. So when an alarm goes off, you can look at that object. You can look at the intelligence that's built into the model. But like you're seeing here, a red box will pop up when an alarm goes off in the building management system, and then you can zoom into that, see all the data that's part of that, and look at, look at the, um, the, the documents as it's linked to that. Got about five minutes here, so I'll, I'll speed up and finish up. But, um, but what's really nice with this is you know, you're zooming into that object. It's linked with the building management system. It's linked with the documents. You know, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about PPPs here. You know, this could be a nice, intelligent way to manage your facility and make sure that you're getting the operational excellence that, that you were planning from the beginning. 
You know, this is one other quick video that was showing the same thing happening, but it's linked to a barcode. So you could scan that barcode and pull up that same information from out in the field. The, the last thing I'd like to touch on is just how we're educating both our own staff as well as, as uh, industry. I mean, it's nice that we have senior level support and engagement um, to help promote these lean and, and uh, BIM type items on our projects. Um, we've got something very interesting happening on SocialCast, which um, is really our internal social networking way internally of sharing ideas. And since we started about two years ago, we've got, now got over 6,000 searchable messages and content strictly about um, technology and lean processes. And I'd, I'd say it's probably one of the best things out there um, that we have that, that is a nice database to search what people are doing and what's, what's being done. We also do weekly webinars where we educate our staff on what's being done on projects. And something that I've been involved with the last three years is uh, Turner BIM University. Um, the first two years it was eight weeks. Uh, last year it was six weeks. And it starts with a weekly flow of lean operational type ideas, the tools, and then how do we, and then let's practice using those tools to help benefit a job. So one week may be estimating, one week may be scheduling, but this last year we actually overlaid lean process concepts on top of that, that BIM University. So looking at value stream mapping, looking at last planner, looking at uh, work breakdown structures as part of that, that, um, that university. We're also doing an innovation series that we're going around the world. We've, we've recently been in, in Moscow and Istanbul and also in India um, and, and recently Montenegro where we're talking about what we're doing with the local um, contractors and designers and trying to bring some of these um, concepts to, to those local markets. Um, we also have an award for innovation that we started last year where we had 250 submissions from some of our staff, grassroots from the bottom up, not from the top down, really, again, from the, the folks graduating from your universities, um, showing innovative things that they're doing on their projects or that they'd like to do, and then we're trying to develop them further. Um, just a, a quick look at you know, where we are. We've, we've done around 500 BIM projects um, for around $35 billion, but at the same time, that's just a small fraction of our work. Um, we're struggling to get down into the projects you know, below $10 million in, in volume. Um, and we're struggling to do more than just the basics, more than just pool planning, more than just clash detection, more than just schedule simulation. But my last slide here, you know, I'd like to just kind of, this is how we talk to our staff. You know, think big. Think big about current inefficiencies in your process, potential project issues, um, you know, the big picture of, you know, um, where we could be, but we got to start small. You know, we're a big company, you know, we're driving 100 kilometers an hour, you know, down the road, and we can't just stop and change out the engine, um, you know, while we're driving down the road building $9 billion worth of work. So you got to start small. So whether it's implementing some of those lean top 10 principles, starting with a software, trying some mobile apps, um, that's how we educate our staff. I think I'm right up to, to the time, um, but thank you. So, uh, well, wow. that's, uh, that's called drinking from a fire hydrant. Um, <laughs> while Brian's there and his uh, adrenaline's pumping, who would like to ask uh, a question? We're, we're uh, running a little short of time, but gee, it would be a shame not to uh, leverage off some of the energy that's in the room right now. And introduction and uh, affiliation. Uh, Sylvester Slavenburg, uh, second contractor in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. I think there's a third one from New Zealand as well. <laughs> uh, who's contractor, by the way, here? Who's you see, Th there are many more many than two. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much for a very impressive uh, um, presentation. I had two questions. The first is, um, how do you do it in a legal way? Because the whole position as a contractor changes uh, uh, from very traditional contracting to doing nearly everything. Uh, how do you do that with, in, uh, with your legal approach? Well, the, um, I'd say it is still all has to go back to that contract. So if the contract is saying drawings and specs, we'll be working in the 3D environment, um, which is helping the process, but it's a little antiquated, but we have to go back then and translate that into 2D drawings and specs, and that contractually is what we have to deliver. So we'll be working in this environment um, because it makes sense and because it's beneficial to the job, but we have to translate that back to you know, the older style contract and, draw and plans and specs, which we have to build off of. So, 
Okay, and the second question, uh, you say you bring your knowledge to Montenegro and India, mm -hmm. and what, what's, your, uh, what's your interest in this, to do that? Well, um, we, we've got work in those areas, and um, we, we'd like to get more work in those areas. So, you know, internationally, Turner, we don't normally take on the general contractor role, more of an advisor in the CM type role, but we want to bring some of this innovation to, you know, some, a smaller city like Budva, Montenegro, where we've got two projects, where we can help benefit the, pro the projects there in that, in that um, market that really hasn't adopted a lot of these things. So it's really, I'd say, taking some of this knowledge that we've, We've been around 111 years, and we've made a lot of mistakes over 111 years, taking some of that um, knowledge and some of these technologies to those developing markets and really help them, you know, learn from our mistakes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm thinking, I'm thinking that uh, we should call it quits there. I know that Brian's going to be around till Friday. Uh, and that he will be around uh, here uh, today, tomorrow and Thursday as well. So uh, I just want to say thank you to Brian. I mean, the, uh, uh, the energy that he brings to the job and the energy that he brings to Turner is quite unique. And uh, I just wonder if you'd join with me in thanking Brian Krauss. Thank you. <laughs>